Welcome to Empowered by Iron, the podcast for female strength athletes by female strength athletes. We are your hosts, Dr. Kristen Lander from Fiercely Fueled Nutrition Coaching and Mary Morton, PhD candidate and weightlifter. Together, we are Empowered by Iron. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Empowered by Iron. This week, we're going to do something a little different. We are just going to have thoughts with Kristen and Mary. Hey, Kristen. What's up, Mary? So recently, especially in the world of weightlifting, but this applies to powerlifting. Oh, wait, before we even get into that, Kristen, you're doing something fun this week. Can you tell everyone what you're doing this week? Yeah, I am traveling to Ontario to speak at the Iron Sisters Strength Camp. I'll be talking about performance-based nutrition for the strength athlete. And I'm super pumped. AKA eat for strength, right? Basically. It's basically eat for strength. Yeah. For those of you who are new, which I've noticed we have quite a few of you. Hello. Welcome. Um, If you don't know, I'm Mary. I'm the PhD student and weightlifter. And this is Kristen, doctor of chiropractic and nutrition extraordinaire. We have this group of women going on right now called Eat for Strength. And they are learning how to fuel their bodies to perform as an athlete, not to cut, not to bulk. They're, They're getting these tools to change their lives. And it's been pretty awesome so far. Wouldn't you say, Kristen? Oh my gosh, so awesome. I love hearing these stories of people, how everything in their life like starts to change as they actually learn to fuel their body. And so things click. Really, They're like, oh my click. gosh, I can't believe I didn't think of this before. And we're like, it's okay. We got you. It is life. I feel like if you're an athlete, it's life-changing information, which is one reason I'm so excited to um, be presenting this information at um, Iron Sisters Strength Camp because it's like every woman who is a strength athlete needs to know this. It's awesome. Right. I love it. And if you have been listening to this and you wish you would have joined on the first one and you're going to the, the Iron Sisters Camp here... You're in luck. No problem. You're good. You're going to learn everything. But if you've been listening and you haven't, and you haven't jumped on the Eat for Strength, you're not sure where to start, we're going to be opening up another group in mid-September. So keep an eye out for that. You can email us any questions you have, but we're really excited to to continue with this. Yeah? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I think everyone that's in the program is like, why didn't I know this information to talk about today? Yeah. Recently in weightlifting, and like I said, applies to powerlifting, there was a big change in weight classes. We knew it was coming. The whole International Weightlifting Federation got together and said, okay, we're going to trash all the old weight classes and we're going to throw new weight classes at you. And so some people landed in different spots, you know, it just depends on where you are. For example, before the change, I was a 69 kilo weightlifter. I sit at about 68 kilos. And when the changes came, the 69 class moved up to 71. So boom, I'm 71. So that means, Kristen, I'm going to gain just three kilos immediately, right? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a f- okay. Here's the funny thing that about these weight class changes is like you, you guys, everyone, you know, you don't have to be just because your weight class says 71 kilos, you don't have to weigh 71 kilos. Like you just have to weigh more than the next lower weight class. So you don't have to suddenly go out and try to put on weight. Um, It just gives you a little bit more room. You don't necessarily have to cut for a meet. um, And you have more room basically just to be able to eat a little bit more if you've been eating in a deficit and just get strong. But you don't have to like suddenly put on three kilos. Right, right. It's like, it's just like your speed limit, you know, it's a suggestion, not necessarily a rule. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But when I see that, I actually go over the speed limit. <laughs> well, so do I. I but see, I've never gotten a ticket, Kristen. So <laughs> la to da. Oh, anyway. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so like a lot of people think that they need to sit on the cusp or when they weigh in, they need yeah. to weigh in it. And say, for example, for the 71 kilo class now, they think that they need to weigh in at 70.95, which right. is dumb. But I think, and we've talked about this a lot, a lot of athletes who, let's face it, I'm not an elite athlete. <laughs> I'm, I wouldn't even really consider yet. myself. You're not athlete. yet. Right. I am getting very strong. Yeah. Um, but right now I'm, I'm not even really a national lifter. I'm more of a local lifter who's just working her way up the ladder. 
But you see, especially through social media, mostly through social media, a lot of these elite weightlifters having to cut for every meet. And you see them say, I weighed in at, you know, 62.98 or 58.00. And this applies for powerlifting too. It's the same thing. But what you don't realize is because of their eliteness, there's a reason that they're cutting down or moving up. There, there's a reason. It's either they're trying to qualify for a world team or they're trying to get on a national team or blah, 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 blah. Right. They're or special. They're just, we get it. Or they're just more competitive at right. that lower weight class. Right. Which, which is hilarious because most women, if you think of, we were talking about this just yesterday, weight classes are a bell curve. You're not going to have as yeah. many on the, the, the lightest weight classes and the heaviest weight classes. Everyone's going to be in the middle. So if you're thinking of going from... Uh, let's say what what is it? You have seventy two and then sixty seven yep. in USPA sixty seven point five sixty seven point five and seventy five. It's seventy five in USAPL. It's seventy two. Okay, USPA is seventy five. So within those kind of middle heavier like one thirty five to one sixty weight classes, honestly, the weight lifted is very similar, and that's because people yes. kind of interchange within that weight class, which means those weight classes are the most competitive. So if you think you're going to move from the 75s to the 67 and gain a huge competitive advantage, even though you're fairly new to lifting, you need to think twice. However, if you're moving from the 75s to the 67 and a half to get that elite total, yeah, that's a different story. Absolutely. So basically what you're saying is that for a lot of people, these weight class changes don't really matter. It's not no. going to make a huge difference. And if you feel like you want to cut just because you want to cut or you, like, you feel like it's somehow going to make you more competitive, like we're not here to shame you f- away from doing that. Do it if you want to do it. Um, I'm telling you as someone who's done it, I, I, I'm... I feel like it didn't matter at all. I placed at the meet that I was, the international meet that I was lifting in that I did this for, I placed exactly the same. What happened was I was intentionally cutting weight just to cut weight. I wanted to drop some body fat and I was, I I got so close to 63 kilos that I was like, oh, well, I might as well keep going. I'll just be a 63 kilo lifter. And then I looked like Skeletor. Well, those last couple kilos were really hard for you, weren't they? They were because I was already really lean. And so it was, it basically was just not, it, I, I did perform well. It did not hinder my performance in any way. It was actually the, I think the highest total I've ever had. Um, I was still kind of a relatively new lifter though. And um, when I look at the results from the 69 kilo versus the 63 kilo lifters from that meet, they I would have fallen exactly the same. I think I got like fourth place versus fifth place or something. I mean, it was basically the same. It didn't matter. Right. Cause you land that those are the one of the three weight classes within that bell curve. Exactly. And so, so my point is it's a whole lot of stress and a whole lot of, it's a whole lot of mental stress and a whole lot of stress on your body um, for maybe not that much benefit. Now, if I had been trying to qualify for that international meet you bet I would have done that and I would be happy that I did it and I got to go and do it. Right. But I, I actually qualified at, at the heavier weight class anyway. So um, yeah, t- totally different story. So, or right. If you're, a, if you're a power lifter and you're trying to hit an elite total or an international elite total, you're trying to, you know, place at worlds or nationals or whatever, go ahead, cut or try to gain whatever, change your weight class. But for a lot of us, I think it doesn't, in weightlifting right now, just lift where you're at and know that you've got some room to grow. If you, you know, your body's going to naturally put on muscle over the years through training and you've got room to grow, which is awesome. Well, and that kind of talks, that leads into what we're talking about with our eight for strength girls this last week was priorities. And, you know, it could be something simple as life priorities, like your family's going to be first and then you lift and then work or, or whatever, whatever your priorities are. But you can also think of it in terms of well, what are my lifting priorities? Do I want to lose weight? Is that my number one goal? Because when you started, Kristen, you wanted to lose weight at first, like you wanted to lean out. 
and yeah. you wanted to Olympic lift. But yeah. then as you went on and kind of you're determining now, strength is your number one goal. And so right. getting stronger doesn't mean necessarily, that doesn't mean you're going to cut. I mean, you're not going to cut. That's Every right. time you cut, it hinders your muscle growth. And especially if you're a new or sub-national level lifter, you need all those extra calories and all that extra time to get to that national level if that's your goal. Let's say getting on the national stage takes an average of five years. Let's just say that. If you spend those five years eating in a surplus, I'm not talking like eating all you want. I'm talking eating a little bit extra just to keep your body in good recovery and build some muscle, but try to minimize fat gain as most you can. It's going to happen. Let's say you spend those five years doing that. In your fifth year, holy shit, you've qualified for nationals. But let's say you took a different route. Let's say in your first two years, you're like, okay, I'm going to cut. Well, now you probably added six months on to that end goal. If you cut again, you probably added another six months on. Yep. So every time you take away food from your body, it's not putting that towards getting stronger. In fact, it's taking away from. So you have to think of it in priorities. Like If you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, gosh, I would love to be leaner. I'm all for that. I support you. I think that that's great. I think that's a great goal. If you look in the mirror and you're like, okay, yeah, I mean, if you're like me, you look in the mirror and you're like, all right, I mean, I got a little extra, but man, I just cleaned 85 and that was pretty cool. So I'm going to keep going with the strength thing. Yeah. That's great as well. I mean, and if you're if you're tiny and you just want to get really big, go out, eat all the food you fucking want. <laughs> yeah. I talk about this a lot with my um, nutrition athletes that I work with. Um, and yeah, it's like, do, you, do which do you want more? Do you want to continue to get stronger or do you want to lean out? Which is more important to you right now? And it, and it's, I'm not saying that you can't get stronger while you're on a cut. You can, we know that you can, I've done it. I've had clients that do it, but you're not getting as strong as you would be getting if you were eating in caloric balance. You're just not. It's right. that's just the way it works. You can get stronger on a cut. You would have put on more strength had you not been cutting. So it's one of those, yeah, you have to really determine which is most important to you right now. And there's not a wrong answer. No, it's absolutely. your body, it's your lifting, it's your, you know, it's your life. It, it, you can choose that. But, you know, don't I one thing we talked about a long time ago was ignore the noise. Like don't get distracted by what everyone else is doing. Do what is best for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so if you see these elite lifters cutting, you have to remember that they've taken into consideration with their coach and their nutrition coach and everyone around them. Like, is this the best thing for me, right. for my goals? And I would like to just for a second applaud the IWF for their higher weight classes for women. There yes. are there are a lot. When I started in weightlifting, seventy five kilo was heavyweight, and seventy five plus was super heavyweight. And That's I was like what one sixty five, yeah, pounds ish, yeah. So considering heavyweight, yeah. actually seventy five plus would be called super heavy super heavyweight. Yeah, that's what I said. Mm-hmm. I know. And in that, there's, really... okay, there's nothing wrong with super heavyweight. There's, no. there's nothing. But the fact that one sixty five. It's not enough. I mean, no, <laughs> it's not enough. It's women are capable of being much bigger and being lean and being much bigger than that. You know what I mean? And so that was actually, sadly, when I was a new lifter, that was one of the determining factors. Was I was horrified, like, oh my gosh, I'm a heavyweight lifter. I don't want to be a heavyweight lifter. I had some body fat to lose, and so I cut weight. And now I'm like, oh my gosh. That, that was terrible. But anyway, now there's like, um, okay, so 75 kilos went up to 76 kilos. And then there's is it 81, 81? 87 and 87, 87 plus? Yes. Hooray. Thank yeah. you, IWF, for recognizing that um, women don't have to be these dainty, petite little things. Although if you are, that's great. That's fine. Yeah. It's just it but there's you know, more room for everybody now. There's more room for everybody. It's more inclusive to women. And I think they are recognizing like, holy shit, women can really build muscle. <laughs> yeah. And we're limiting them by yes. not having those extra weight classes. Yes. So I I guess to sum this up, and 
I think this is what the point we really wanted to get across is tomorrow morning, go step on the scale. See what you weigh. What you weigh, take that. Go look at the weight classes and see what's the one that you fit in, whether you're in the middle of it, whether you're basically at the bottom of it, or whether it's the, the exact top. That's your weight class. That's right. it. Like, And then be done. Forget about it. And then when it comes to competition time, eight weeks out, and you reassess, maybe you've put on muscle. Maybe you put on a little bit of weight. Then you can go up. Or let's say you've lost a little bit. Then you can go down. But don't be so fucking stressed about the weight classes that you forget to lift. <laughs> Lifting yeah. is the most important part of all this. And eating. It is. It and eating absolutely. <laughs> and if you're competing mostly at the local level, um, don't try to cut weight like to be more competitive. Because okay, first of all, at local meets, there might be no one in your weight class. There might be twenty people in your weight class. There might be a national lifter in your weight class, and you're a new lifter. Um, or you could be like me in USPA. I just started in USPA. And guess who also just came over to USPA and is in my weight class? Kimberly <laughs> Walford. The Do you Kimberly. Think, <laughs> the Kimberly Walford. Do you think if we showed up to the same meet that she wouldn't beat me? You just don't. My point is you don't know who's going to show up to a local meet. And so just going in and trying to do the best you can do if you're not, as long as you're not trying to qualify for something, um, just lift where you are and focus on having a fantastic meet, setting some PRs and having fun. Yeah. Cause the less you have to worry about your weight, the more fun you're going to have. Lifting. So much, so much. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've beaten that horse. <laughs> dead. <laughs> it is dead. It has been dead, which is a hard thing for a vegan to say. <laughs> but next thing. So I don't know if you guys noticed over the weekend or over the, sorry, last week, Instagram <laughs> introduced this really annoying feature that everyone decided to use, which I thought was the most annoying thing. So I thought, hell, why not we use it? But it lets you ask a question. So we pose the question to all of our followers on Instagram. Uh, you can follow us at, at Empowered by Iron. And we're going to go through a few of them. So first and foremost, we have one from, and I'm so sorry if I pronounce this wrong. Uh, her Instagram name is Rebby Tussin. Like Robitussin? Yeah. Or um, I thought Ruby Tuesday. <laughs> 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 Sorry, we're totally butchering your name. I I apologize uh, profusely. Maybe we just shouldn't say names. <laughs> okay, let's just leave the names out. <laughs> okay. So her question was, should I train with a slight fever and tonsillitis? Ready, Christian? Kristen, three, two, one. No. no. Stop. Go home. Go to the doctor. Take a nap. Eat. Sleep. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Right. Um, cause let's talk about just really briefly. Um, this podcast is not supposed to have a whole lot of science in it, but I just have to, I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> You, training depresses your immune system temporarily. So if you're already compromised, if your immune system is already compromised, you're going to make it worse. So, you know, there is evidence to suggest that going for, you know, a walk, doing like some really light activity may be helpful when you're sick, but don't go train hard. When I was deep in my eating disorder... I used to go do hours of cardio with a 101 degree fever and pneumonia. Because that's what you should do when you have pneumonia is go to cardio. Well, in my brain, oh. I was like, well, if I'm sick anyway, I don't want to get sick and fat at the same time. So I, I should just go work out. When you were actually probably sick from training too much and not eating enough. Oh, I wasn't even training at that point. It was just... Well, working, working out, whatever. myself to the yeah. bone. Yeah, yeah. So don't do it. Just sleep and go to your doctor. Get better. Yes. Okay. Next one is how do I get over my somewhat irrational fear of one rep maxes? Kristen and I completely differ on this one. So Kristen, go first. Well, no, I don't have a good answer because I, I don't have this fear and I right. don't, that's Which is like, why we completely differ. <laughs> <laughs> my fear is actually doing sets above five. <laughs> <laughs> that's when I like feel like I'm going to throw up and I'm like, I don't know if I'm able to do this. I love one rep maxes. So I, I don't, I don't have a good answer for this. Um, but yeah, Mary does. 
I train best and sub maximal anything. Whenever my coach programs a one rep max for anything, it, it doesn't matter what it is. I freak the hell out. I, I think about it all week because I look at my programming before trying to plan my week. I think about it all week. I obsess over it. And then when it gets the time when, when I'm there doing it, it's like I've thought about it so much that I've already let myself down. But yeah, so like I've never <laughs> sorry, I just burped and talked. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never um I've never PR'd my clean and jerk. I mean I've PR'd my squat and whatnot outside, but my clean and jerk I've never and my snatch I've never PR'd outside of competition. I've only PR'd in competition. And that's because I mean I know it's coming, but I get so calm on meet day that yeah. I just do it. And whatever it is, I just do it. But when it's at the gym, I just, there's this fear of I need to do it technically right. I need to get it overhead. I need to make sure I don't press out. I need to like look at something. I need to you know, blah, 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 blah. So yeah. um, I don't really know how you get over it because I haven't gotten over it. <laughs> so if you figure out what the answer is, just let me know. Yeah. yeah. I wish I could help. I, just, I wish I could help with this. Like I have ideas, but because I haven't experienced this, I don't think that my ideas are valid. Yeah. <laughs> like, if I you just, haven't competed, maybe go try and competing because the adrenaline you get on competition day is insane. Absolutely. I, I, hey, I have to talk about that for a minute because there's oh, a please. really big difference between, I don't know if this person's a weightlifter or a power lifter, but um, being now that I compete in both, um, I've never PR'd, I'm pretty sure I've never PR'd my snatch or my clean and jerk in a competition. I have matched my PRs, but I've never PR'd on the platform. Some of it might be just the way that my coach and I do it. We might play it a little conservative. Um, but um, powerlifting, that adrenaline, woo, buddy. Mm -hmm. I've, I mm -hmm. think I've PR'd, I mean, I've only done two meets, but I think I PR'd every single lift in both meets, like multiple times. Yeah, you did. And I told you this and we were training for it and you couldn't hit, I mean, just you had a number in your head and you couldn't hit it in training. And I was like, don't even worry about it. You're going to get that at the meet. And you're like, what? I can't even get it now. I can't even believe I didn't get it now. I'm like, well, yeah. well, we're chill right now. There's no adrenaline. You are so calm. And you get yeah. to the meet day and you're like, all right, I'm on drugs. Let's do it. Not on drugs, Mary. Adrenaline drugs. Oh, it's like, uh, <laughs> USADA is going to show up at my house now. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> They're too busy worrying about all the other athletes. I mean, I would take it as a compliment if you saw it showed up at my house. I'd be like, oh my God, come in, sit down. You want to watch me pee? That's fine. Do you need a chair while you watch me pee? That's cool. Would you like some coffee? <laughs> That's actually one of my biggest fears is being drug tested and them having to watch me pee because I have a shy bladder and I can barely pee in the bathroom if someone's in there. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Kristen knows I don't have a shy bladder. <laughs> I can pee anywhere, anytime. Anywhere, anytime. There wasn't a bathroom in our own lifting place, and I would oh, pee God. in a cup <laughs> and just dump it outside. It's gross. I don't care, but I wasn't about to walk across the street to go to the bathroom. Uh uh. Okay. <laughs> We're sharing a lot of information today. <laughs> well, today is our thoughts. And my thoughts are why Peanut do we have to use toilets? Toilets are overrated. I saved water is what I did. <laughs> okay. Next yes. one is how to handle your significant other if they don't 100% support your lifting. We did yes. an episode on this, I think, forever ago. It was called Bend, Don't Break, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the basic synopsis is to answer your question, um, you have to not give a fuck what they think. You yeah. have to tell them if it's important to you, you say, this is important to me. I'm going to do it without your support or with it. So that's how it is. And for me, when I told my significant other that, at first he was kind of resistant to it because he didn't really understand that world. He didn't under understand what it meant. And now he's 100% supportive. I mean, he has no idea what a snatch and a clean and jerk is, but he he knows it makes me happy and that makes him happy. <laughs> yes, totally. And I, I really think that um, it's one of those things where if it's really important to you, continue to do it. 
if the person can't handle that, if they can't handle you doing something that is um, really important to you and makes you feel good, if they eventually don't get on board with that and they continue to, I don't know, you know, how unsupportive they are, but if they are particularly unsupportive, that's maybe a red flag. I would say. Absolutely. And um, we talked a lot in that Ben Don't Break episode about how you you may have to make compromises and sacrifices because that's what a relationship is. But ultimately, if they are not, if they continue to not get on board, I would have to say that at some point in my life, every, you know, like family member or significant other with my lifting has it's, uh, on some level, maybe not been supportive just because they didn't understand. And I never stopped. And eventually they just all got on board because they love me and they love seeing me happy. But um, if that ends up not happening, maybe that's a red flag. Like why is someone not supporting something you love that makes you happy? Right. So give them time, give them time and Give them ultimately, time. Ultimately, but... if they don't, ultimately, it might be a deal breaker and that's okay. Yeah. And yeah, don't let it, don't let it get you. Don't, but don't give up something that makes you very happy just because they don't like it or understand it. That's the main thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The last question that we got is kind of a doozy and it's a question that we. <laughs> it's a big don't... one. Yeah, we don't have an answer to. So if you're listening to this and you're like, wow, Mary and Kristen, what the hell? Just know that we're trying. Okay. We we have some ideas. Well, it's because there's no easy answer. No, so we it's have not a some ideas. One plus two equals three type deal. Okay. So we got asked sexual abuse slash misconduct in in the sport, powerlifting or weightlifting. What are we going to do to fix this? And like I said, this is a heavy question. Heavy. There is not, there's not an answer, unfortunately, that's so straightforward. But there are steps that we can do, we think, to move this forward. Do you want to give us them our first thought, Kristen? Well, I think that the biggest thing is, is number one, if there is... Okay, so between coaches and athletes, particularly, there is um, there's like a a coach is in a position of power over an athlete, whether they want to believe that or not, it is true, and I think that that comes with a lot of responsibility, and I think that um, as athletes, well, because your athlete looks up to you, I mean, they- absolutely. They look to you for your programming. They look to you for your coaching and your life wisdom. I mean, some of my best mentors have been my coaches. Right. And so, you know, if, if, if a, if a coach is acting in a way that is not in line, um, that is not professional, I think calling your coach out on that is important, um, or calling out another athlete, whatever it is, anything in the sport, um, I think, calling people out um, for misconduct, um, reporting these things if they continue to be an issue. And um, especially if it's sexual abuse, I think that as women, and not not saying that sexual abuse can't happen to men, but um, for us as women, I think supporting each other and creating a community of support where it is okay to report these things and that we will support each other in doing so. Um, You know, I can say, I know firsthand that reporting sexual abuse is um, an incredibly difficult thing to do. And there's so much um, shame involved in it um, that it, it, a lot of women just want to forget that things ever happened. Um, and there's a lot of people, uh, you know, that's a whole process of reporting that people don't want to live through. But I think that if we can all really create this community to support each other through this, um, that I think that this will help. I think that, that, that some things continue because they go unreported. 
people think that they can get away with things or in the instance of, I mean, obviously I think everyone knows what sexual abuse is, but in the instance of, you know, maybe making a comment to an athlete that makes them uncomfortable. Sometimes I think that, that people have, we've stayed quiet for so long that, that sometimes men and even women maybe don't even realize how inappropriate their comments might be, which is really giving people the benefit of the doubt there. But I think that that happens. And I think that calling people out on it and educating them and saying, look, that's not a good thing to say. I would appreciate if you didn't talk to me that way again or reporting it if it continues. I think it's all important. Right. It, it's creating that that safe space. And over time, you know, as things come out, as things are reported, as people are called out, we will start to weed out the people who just, no matter if you slam their head into the brick wall of feminism and happiness and love, they will never get it. They will always think right. that they are better than and they deserve more or whatever. But it, the way that this will work is over time, we weed those people out. They're either banned from the sport um, or they're they lose all their athletes. Or, you know, there's there's many options. But I think the first part is, like you said, just creating that safe space, you know? Yeah. yeah. Which, because I think that one of the big fears that some women have is, well, if I come out against this person, no one's going to believe me. Um, they're going to think. Especially if it's a big name, especially if it's someone, because yeah. this happened in both, I mean, weightlifting and powerlifting, big names were called out on things. And immediately the community rushes to support this big name because, it's right. a big They're like, name. well, it's so and so. They couldn't have done that. It's, it's my hero. But then the other side is, well, it is so and so. They definitely could have done that, you know. And right. and some of the and I'll say this. I know Kristen doesn't really want to talk about this, but I will, just because it may be too gossipy for this podcast. But there's a lot of accounts and businesses that are based on looking at these things and trying to analyze them and basically creating gossip websites or gossip pages over this this bullshit shit yeah well Whatever. it's if not we, that it's i mean if it, it's all a matter of public record right, right it, like, it's, it's just there. that it gets way too deep into people's personal lives and i'm very sensitive to that yeah and like sure sh- whoever the person was that is being accused yeah whatever you can have their feeling your feelings of them and then if these pages go so far as to release potential victim names or release the victim's names, then we've got a bigger problem because now that person is subjected to the harassment from people who follow these other people, like the the perpetrator. So first of all, respect people's privacy. If someone's coming out and talking about this, there's a huge likelihood that it happened. Right. Because it's so hard. No one wants to go through this. They go yes. through it because they want this person stopped and they don't want anyone else to ever have to go through this again. And there are some instances where like you hear in the news where maybe one or two or some person accused someone of rape and it just didn't happen and they have proof and those people are batshit crazy. We can all agree someone who says that someone else raped them and it turns out to not true be true sure. are just fucking crazy people and that what person the hell has are you doing? some problems that need to be handled. Yes. Sure. But if it's someone else, you know, who the last thing we need to do is go bully them for this choice that they've made. Yeah, we do not need to be bullying victims. We need to let the 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 justice do what the justice does. And that is look at all the evidence because it's going to come out one way or the other. Usually right. if there's one, there's two. And usually if there's two, there's three. Not yeah. necessarily, but that's all the time. But if there was one, there will likely be two. And if there was two, there will likely be three over time if this right. person is allowed to do whatever. Right. So because like, because if it goes unreported, they think, oh, I can get away with that or oh, right. this is acceptable behavior or no one cares or whatever. And and that's not and that's not the case at all. It's just that the nature of these things makes them very difficult for women to report. Yeah. And even some men, I mean, and yeah. even men, it's, yes. it's a whole thing, but I, I think the first step, just like you said, is we need to create that community and right. we need to do it fast because the shit is coming out, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's everywhere. Well, and I think that that's just part of like this, you know, this me too movement of just our overall general society, right. Is that women are finally saying, 
enough bullshit. I'm sick of your guys' stuff. And, you know, you need to be held accountable. And Mm -hmm. which I think is great. You know, I think that that's a, I think that that's a fantastic thing. I think that, and I think that through this process, um, some men have learned like, oh shit, my behavior is apparently offensive and no one told me, I don't know how you can be so like unaware. (laughs) Well, I mean, I I can understand it. I can, I can, I don't agree with it, but I can understand how people, especially guys, you know, they say things to their guy friends that you're like, uh, why the hell would you ever say that? But if they ever said that to a woman, it's like, Jesus Christ, man, what the hell are you thinking? Um, but I will say if you're in a situation where you have a coach or an athlete and you're afraid to come out and talk to your coach about something they said to you because you're afraid he's he or she is going to yell at you or kick you off the team or something, then that is definitely a red flag saying that this is probably not a great situation for you and that you should report it. And if there's right. an advocate you can have on the team or who knows the team or, you know, Get yourself someone else who you can tell it to and maybe confront this person together. It's always good to have a witness. Yeah. Well, and you know, this just like the bigger picture here is that as I think that we all just need to be supporting each other and creating. So in strength sports, okay, if I'm going for a PR, you know, and I'm like scared or terrified. Well, we already talked about it. I'm not scared. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, if, you know, you're so I, I have been like a head case going into powerlifting meets because it was new to me and I just didn't trust anything and I didn't trust myself. And I relied heavily on Mary to provide that level of trust. Like you can do this. You can believe, you know, you need to believe in yourself. I believe in you. The same thing needs to happen if there's some sexual misconduct occurring in your sport, right? We need to have that same exact culture that we have of lifting each other up and supporting each other when we feel we're not strong enough to do it ourselves, Mm -hmm. to be able to do that when these things happen and to be able to go to our friends or go to our coaches or go to someone else in the sport and say, this happened. I, I, I feel really beat down by this and I need some help standing up. Exactly. Exactly. And justice will prevail. And that brings me to our final point that we want to talk about is you don't need to steal other people's light bulbs to light your chandelier, especially as women. We don't need to be bringing other women down to build ourselves up. Right. And I don't want to get, you know, there's no specifics of this, but it's just you to be a good lifter doesn't mean that your friend who trains with you needs to be a bad lifter. You both can right. be good lifters. Yep. There yep. is enough room for everyone to be the best that they can be. And I think that our strength community gets stronger when we support each other in that. And we mm-hmm. want the best for everyone. Like, right. I don't want to get first at a meet just because someone else had a shitty meet. I want to beat them because they had a good meet and I was better. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We don't exactly. need to be tearing other women down just to build ourselves up. Mm-hmm. So think of that next time you, I don't know, just think of that. <laughs> it's something that's heavy on our minds a lot this week, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think that that was it. I think that was good thoughts. Yeah. Good thoughts and thanks. Um, our thoughts. If you haven't already, go join our Facebook group page, Women in Strength Athlete Resource. Um, It's an athlete-focused resource page where we answer as many questions as we can, and we have some great discussion on there about everything training, nutrition, and recovery-related. We also have a Patreon. If you want to support us and support this podcast by giving us a monthly donation, that would be amazing, and you can help us continue to create great content and send Kristen to Canada. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I said that Iron Sisters is they're completely actually taking care of her. They are. They are. She's, she's a royal princess. Oh. And uh, if you're interested in nutrition coaching, Kristen has her nutri- nutrition coaching business, Fiercely Fueled Nutrition. Um, you can always reach her through either Empowered by Iron Gmail or Fiercely Fueled at gmail.com. So 
any of those linked below. We love you guys and we will talk to you next time. Bye.